Well, good morning, members and officers, um, and anyone who may well be watching us live this morning as we start our Corporate Overview and Scrutiny Committee on Tuesday the 20th of June 2023 in the Oak Room here in the County Buildings. Can I have apologies, please? I've received apologies from councillors Peters and Francis. Councillor White. Could I give apologies for Councillor Spencer? I spoke to him on the phone late last week. He's indisposed for a while. Thank you. Do we have any declarations of interest, please? No, I'm fine. No, that's good. Uh, before we go any further, if I could just first of all say how delighted I am to have been asked to take on this role as Chairman of Corporate Overview and Scrutiny, and I say that while the leader is here, so they can hear me say that. I'm really pleased to be doing it and working with all you, which is really de a delight for me. And I also want to just, first of all, and I'll, I'll probably do it during part of the meeting, just pay tribute to Colin Gratrix, who held this role before, and what a sterling job he did and has done and is doing for this County Council in his, in his role here as Chairman. So, without further ado, we'll move on to item three, which is the meetings and meetings held on the 9th of May, 2023. Shall I go through them page by page? And if anyone's got any corrections, please show. So page one, page two, page three, page four. Happy I signed those to the record? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you very much. Before we move on to agenda item four, I just wanted to welcome uh, to us this morning our county solicitor, Kate Loder. Very welcome. Chris Eberly, and also to Lindsay Bissell, who is our Assistant Director for Strategy and Transformation. You're very welcome. So we'll move on to item four, which is the Integrated Performance, Performance and Finance Final Outturn Report 22-23. Uh, Councillor White. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Um, could I just place on record um, the the fact that you and I have had a, uh, an early conversation with your new role as Chairman of the uh, Corporate Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Uh, I'm clear about your expectations of me and Cabinet members, uh, and indeed you've articulated uh, the points about Cabinet members' attendance at scrutiny meetings uh, across the board. Uh, that's been duly noted, uh, Mr Chairman, and um, I will make sure that Cabinet members are aware of your concerns on behalf of other chairs of other committees as well, to make sure that we, as Cabinet members, as the Executive, take seriously the role that we uh, fulfil and indeed the accountability that you hold us uh, up to uh, in the part of your role of scrutiny. Uh, Mr Chairman, I don't intend to speak for long on this because this is an opportunity for you to ask questions of me. Um, I will deal with any sort of broader questions and those of a political nature. And uh, Lindsay Blissett, who's here uh, assisting me this morning uh, on her first time out, I think, at scrutiny. Uh, so, um, just on that, be, be gentle, um, because it is Lindsay's first time. Um, that's a I suppose a subliminal message to some members of the committee, just a reminder that some of the difficult questions are extremely difficult, uh, and we'll do our best to answer them, but we'll get back to you if we can't. Um, you'll see the, uh, the format of the report uh, has been changed for some time, and I was rather glad of that, uh, that change, because what it does is it uh, puts on page 11 uh, very, very clearly, precisely where we stand um, as um, an authority with our out outturn. Um, clearly, children and families remains a concern. Uh, particularly the finances of children's services. And you'll see that uh, in the commentary provided by Councillor Parry, uh, the overspend for um, the authority is predominantly based around children's services, uh, and that is because of the high cost of care packages or placements, um, which is something we are working on. But you'll also notice that uh, within children's services, the numbers are starting to level off, uh, and I hope that that continues to be, uh, continues to be the trend indeed. At some points, uh, it'll level off and then start to go down as we're able to work with courts and others uh, to do the early intervention work that needs to prevent children coming into care. Health and care remains uh, in a good condition. Uh, however, you'll, you'll see that there are challenges contained in there. Uh, the portfolio hold of health and care is particularly concerned around deprivation of liberty safeguards, uh, which I know Councillor uh, Perry has been involved with when she was chair of the Health Scrutiny Committee, concerns around the numbers, the cost of the assessments uh, continues to be an issue. Um, 
uh, Councillor Pert will be aware that liberty protection safeguards are the successor piece of legislation that we are anticipating to replace deprivation of liberty safeguards. That hasn't come through. Uh, we have um, been in correspondence with the Secretary of State to highlight uh, our concerns around that because it is driving cost. Some of the uh, requirements for assessment of deprivation of liberty safeguards defy common sense in many respects. Um, but it, it, we, we've got what we've got for the time being, but it doesn't look like there's going to be legislative time available to us to do anything about that. Uh, children's services I've talked about, I just want to draw your attention to the rate per 10,000 at 82, uh, slightly higher than the national benchmark of 70, uh, but lower than the regional benchmark of 88. That regional benchmark is skewed somewhat by some authorities who've got very high numbers in care compared to us. Um, so I think that uh, we could strip out some of the authorities and say, actually, is there a better comparison regionally? But it is what it is. And um, I'm confident that we will continue to make progress in uh, children's services. Um, economy, infrastructure and skills um, is all green. Um, if Councillor White was here, I'd be ribbing him because it would be the uh, what I describe as the ribbon-cutting portfolio. Uh, all you've got to turn up is with a pair of scissors, cut the ribbon and open stuff. But there are some challenges there, particularly around skills. And I know that uh, Councillor Clements has been looking in some detail about uh, an issues like that. Um, there are some successes set out in economy, infrastructure and skills that I won't highlight for now because I, I'd really rather take the questions. And then moving to corporate services, uh, delivery there is green on, and finance is green in both counts. Um, some of, the, some of the issues that we are dealing with at the moment is the Boundary uh, Commission report. As you know, that's still rumbling on and is a matter of interest to this committee. Um, but I anticipate that that will make its way through um, over the next coming months. Um, sickness absence, final point. Um, sickness absence has risen a little bit, um, but it's significantly lower than it was um, back in 2009. Um, I'd rather it was lower. Um, wouldn't we all? But um, uh, we continue to work hard to try and reduce that sickness absence as best we can. So, Mr Chairman, uh, a very quick run through the report, um, and I'm more than happy th with your consent, Mr Chairman, to take questions. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, members, I think for ease and continuity, um, should we go through, it, through the report as it is in the report before us, so that we're not jumping from section to section? If we just go through each section and to make sure we, we bottom it out and get all the, the questions and, and, and the challenges there and then we'll move on to the next section. So I think if we start moving about we'll probably uh, lose our way at some stage and I don't want us to do that. So if, if we can do it in that way I think that'll make uh, life easier. Councillor Pert, you're looking at me a bit. Sorry Chair and good morning. Uh, does that mean you're going to go page by page so I don't lose track of where you're up to? Because I don't want to lose the chance to come back and ask the odd question. No, not at all. I just thought if we did it in sections to make sure we don't miss any of the parts out and we can, we can come back. I just wanted to make, just to ease that everyone wasn't jumping from page to page if, and we'd miss anything out. So if members are happy with that, we'll, we'll, we'll go through in the, in the order that's in here. Um, and probably most of the questions will be around the first section around children's services and the work that's going on there. So if we can do that, that will be fine. So um, I'll keep my comments for a bit later on. So who would, who would like to start then if we're starting with the health and care? Councillor Clements. Um, sorry, this, I think I may have jumped forward to children and family, sorry. Um, it says in the report that there's an increased demand for SEND um, and EHCPs. Do we know why that is? Is it in certain areas and how has the rise in homeschooling affected that? Um, the, the reason for the increase in the number of uh, special educational needs children is, is something which I think lots of organizations are tackling. Um, we're seeing an increase in the prescription of um, drugs for children with attention disorders. Um, I suppose anecdotally, um, this is without evidence, but it's what it feels like to me is that um, social media plays a role in the atten attention that children are able to give to school, plus diet, plus sleep. You combine those things together, then um, it does have an impact on children's uh, outcomes and attention spans. 
as EHCPs are concerned, I think that um, the, because um, parents are entitled to have EHCPs uh, when they request one, um, then these requests come forward with increasing frequency. There are a vast number of EHCPs that are actually requested, uh, and if the, if the parent wants them, then they have to be undertaken. Um, I don't know whether or not the school is encouraging the parents to apply for an EHCP or whether the EHCPs are coming from the parents. I'll have to look into that in some, some more detail. As far as the geographical distribution is concerned, which I, I think is what the last point of your question was angling at, um, I don't know the answer to whether or not there's more in, in Cannock than there are in Tamworth or Moorlands, um, but we can find out. Um, yeah, we can get data per district for EHCPs. Um, as I say, the, the SEND thing is something that, um, that it, it is a worrying increase, uh, and I'm not quite sure what the basis of it is. Um, I'm sure other people have their own theories, but um, I've done a lot of reading around this recently, um, and there are some theories around as to what could be the cause of it, but um, I'll leave it at that, Mr Chairman. Uh, uh, we, that we need to give you some better answers than the ones I've just given you, Councillor Clements, because I've given you a sort of waffly one and there needs to be a better answer. Yeah, thank you for that, Councillor White. I was just going to ask as well, um, do you feel that there's an unfair demand put on teachers within schools with these EHCPs? Um, I'm being, being very careful what I say. Um, for me, I feel that sometimes there is, um, but I'd like your views on that, please. Um, we've got some councillors who are, have got spouses who are teachers, and I, I think that their observation is over time, teaching has become an increasingly challenging profession, um, and not just spouses who are teachers, but also um, children who are te grown-up children who are teachers. Um, I don't know whether or not the, the number of EHCPs provides an additional challenge for teachers or not, or whether or not it actually helps with the teaching environment, because you can get... You get more money for somebody who's got an EHCP, which means you can allocate uh, an additional teaching assistant or whatever to the person, to the child who's got the EHCP. So I can't really answer that. But what I do know is that those people that I have spoken to in the teaching profession uh, do find it uh, increasingly challenging. My, my wife's a former teacher uh, from Chasetown High School many years ago now, but she's still got friends within the profession. Uh, and they do find it uh, an extremely hard, um, hard workplace uh, what with the workload and some of the children presenting them with quite a few challenges on a daily basis. Councillor Yates. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, just looking at uh, page 18, item number 12, the Staffordshire Warmer Homes Programme. Uh, I can see that some councils, obviously, by inference, are, are lagging behind on update on this, and Staffordshire Morelands comes into that category, as does uh, South Staffordshire. Um, I'm just wondering whether th there's two things here. One is that I think only houses which have got an energy performance rating of uh, B or below qualify. There's, there's, an, there's an income limit as well. I think it's £31,000. Uh, and there is a question about how that is actually actually promoted. So I'm just wondering, as this meets into everybody is suff everybody suffering from the uh, cost of living crisis to a greater or lesser extent, and obviously the, the substantial increases in, in energy prices, which are going to last like to and last over this uh, winter. I'm just wondering whether you know a promotional. Uh, campaign, probably through social media or, or whatever, or, or, or perhaps something which can be sent out to district council so they can pr promote themselves, uh, would increase uptake, and whether there is any room for flexibility to improve all houses effectively, you know, perhaps even, you know, perhaps band C, band, uh, C houses, uh, where effectively you can get a band C without any renewables, and we really want to push to uh, try and install renew renewables where, where possible. Uh, so I'm just wondering if there's any scope to be a bit, little bit more flexible, a little bit more broader, a little bit more louder about the scheme, so to speak. Uh, thank you, Councillor Yates. Um, we, we promoted the Staffordshire Warmer Homes Scheme very, very heavily whilst it's going on. Um, we have uh, some districts and boroughs across the county. Uh, Tamworth, uh, Councillor Oates, uh, obviously whilst he was the leader of Tamworth, uh, was instrumental in promoting that uh, strongly within his borough. What? 
Don't, oh, sorry, was I not meant to mention that? It's not, it's not a raw nerve, okay. Um, did promote it very heavily whilst he was um, uh, leader of, I won't say it again, because that's just rubbing it in even more, isn't it? Um, yeah, um, but you raise, you raise a, a point that I tried to tackle with the NHS, um, which was what I wanted the, the Warmer Homes to Fund to do was those areas where um, if, if they have a patient that's presenting with respiratory issues, um, then the question would be, what's the cause of the respiratory issues? You can give a pill or two to solve the respiratory problem, but if the, if the cause of the respiratory problem is due to a damp home or badly insulated home that somebody can't afford to heat, then surely we want to be getting that home insulated no matter what their circumstances. Um, I, I'm afraid to say I hit a brick wall on that. Um, the question was asked, um, but it was, it was a case of, well, actually, we're very busy and we need incentivizing, I think was the phrase that was used, um, which for people who've been involved in that sector know what incentivizing actually means. Um, but I wanted, I wanted to see that warmer homes um, scheme prioritized to those people whose health was in the, in the, in the worst state uh, as a consequence of, obviously, their houses. Anyway, it is what it is. We've got the circumstances um, that we have at the moment with the assessments that we do. We do promote it heavily. I would like it to be done in a slightly different way, but um, we have to stick with what we've got for now. But um, we'll continue to promote it um, as we move forward. Do you want to come back, Councillor Oates? No, Councillor Oates. Oh. Have I sorted this? Uh, sorry, I, was, um, I wanted to probe and challenge uh, the leader's response to Councillor Clements uh, in terms of SEND referrals and, and performance in schools. Uh, and the reason I wanted to challenge it was uh, the question was asked, what were the reasons behind it? Uh, and the leader responded with a, a number of reasons, including pressures from social media. Uh, and whilst I accept there are pressures from social media, uh, and this isn't a dig at the leader, it's, uh, it's an easy out when it comes to making a reason for something changing. And we see this in the press all the time. Uh, we see uh, a tragic incident take place, and two lines down the news story is, uh, we'd like to explain that this is not part of some online social media challenge or game. Well, actually, you know, they, these things are very, very rare in terms of online challenges and games. And actually, the thing that we've missed, and I think uh, I'd like to raise with the leader, in terms of referrals and, and challenges with, with children in school, is our kids were locked up for two years. We are now trying to employ 18-year-olds uh, in customer services who have no social skills because they lost two years of social interaction. Um, I, I now manage a, a, the premier night spot in Belgrave, Belgrave Sports and Social Club. Um, we have 18, 18th birthday parties, and we're one of the few places that has 18th birthday parties because they come with a reputation. I can tell you now, I will have an 18th birthday party every night of the week and not have a single issue. Because the 18-year-olds now haven't grown up like I grew up. When I was 18, there's a potential I might have had a pint before I was 18 years old. These kids haven't. They come, they have two pints, and they're done for the night. Give me a room full of 30-year-olds, and I guarantee there's going to be an argument, there's going to be glasses broke, there's all sorts. And I'm... Um, digressing a little bit, but for me, I don't, you're barred, Alan. Um, for me, I don't think we've really got to grips with the outcomes of the pandemic and locking our children up for those crucial teenage years. Uh, and I'm talking about 18 year olds, but if we pick up the point that Councillor Clements raised and it was around, around education, I struggle with my 15 year old. I, 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 I pre-planned for the pandemic and had loads of children, uh, so, so they still had a community when they were locked up. Um, that was the thinking behind it. Now, um, I struggle to get my 15-year-old to school. He's anxious, he, he doesn't want to go. Uh, so the school's response to that is, parents are in trouble because he's late. Well, actually, you know what? It's a devil's own game getting him there. And the reason it's a devil's own game is because those crucial years when he was starting his high school career, 11, 12, 13, he was at home. He was at home with us. Now, I've got to drag him out of bed, drag him to school, 
Sit with people he hasn't bonded with. Sit with teachers who are trying to, not teachers, but you know, the establishment who are trying to tick boxes on lateness, attendance, and everything else. And actually, he's falling through the gaps. And I'm using my son as an example, but this is quite common because of the impact that that pandemic had on us. And I don't think we've quite understood that, and I don't think we've got the, pl the, the things in place to support the young children we've got uh, going through the education process. Uh, and I'm not saying it's, it's a Staffordshire County Council only response. You know, I, I appreciate the, the education market is very complex, but I just wanted to, to remind people that actually we did lock our children up for two years, and that's having a massive impact on the way they are, they are integrating in, 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 a, in a, uh, interacting with, with society in a way completely different to how we did. Um, as it happens, um, Councillor Oates, I've just finished a book called Stolen Focus by Johan Hari, uh, and it talks about the impact of social media, and it also talks about the loss of play for children. Um, and there's an entire section on, on children being play-starved. Um, we live in one of, the, one of the safest times in, our, in human history. Uh, when you go out, you're not going to get eaten by anything. Um, the, it is a generally safe environment that we live in. Um, but children are discouraged from going out, um, not just by the things that's, that are stealing their attention in the home, like computer games, but also because they're the very parents who are meant to be encouraging them out to play uh, are saying, actually, you're best off staying in. You, you see how many children in, at, say, age 12 have ever run an errand to a shop. By the time I was eight, I was going to get cigarettes from a nan. The, the shopkeeper put it in a plain brown paper bag for me because it wasn't legal to do that, but you know what I mean. You know, it, it, I was walking to school from the age of five on my own, uh, and uh, you see now kids getting dropped off at school because they're, they're not encouraged to walk. And then you layer in uh, the point that you make about um, having to be locked up for two years because of COVID, and I think that exacerbates the problem. It, it is a multi-factor problem um, for which there are no easy solutions, and I think maybe... Here we go, back at you. Um, maybe there's a piece of work to be done looking at how we restore the focus of our children. And there's initiatives uh, in the Stolen Focus book about um, uh, getting kids out to play in an unstructured way. Because when you do put them out to play, uh, it's always in a structured way. So it's Friday night, it's football night. There's a set of rules for football uh, that you have to adhere to, otherwise you get sent off. Um, Thursday night, you go out to do um, scouts. There's a set of rules for scouts. You can't do it unstructured play. But you send two, two, uh, two or three kids out, just say, off you go and play. And they're thinking, what, what are we going to do? I don't know, I've got no idea. Well, make up some games in the woods or something like that. And, and that's the thing that, that is, is missing as well. So this Stolen Focus book, which I say finished on Saturdays, it happens, um, is an outstanding read if you're interested in it. And it's got some ideas about how we recover the focus and recover the ability to imagine a world and its possibilities as a child. Councillor Oates, do you want to come back? Uh, it's 12.87 on Amazon. I'll have a look. Cheers. Thank you. Councillor Pert. Thank you, uh, Chair. And first of all, congratulations on his elevation to, to my colleague uh, and namesake, uh, Jeremy uh, Oates. Um, equally, uh, congratulations to, to Lindsay on joining such an austere, austere uh, uh, organisation, and to you, obviously, Chair. Um, some of these graphs are really good um, because, actually, they tell some very stark stories. Um, and I, I want to come back to, to that, but I want to ask three questions, if I may, please, Chair. Um, the first one relates to um, the chart on page 30 of the report, um, it's um, page 26 of the actual pack. It starts uh, health and care dashboard care commissioning. Um, it would seem to me uh, that um, there is some changes between those taking provision of home care um, versus, uh, versus care homes. Is there anything that we should read into that? Um, and obviously, you know, I'm fully supportive that if, if, if I was in the need of support and care, I would much prefer to be um, in my own familiar surroundings. Um, but, but is there a trend starting there which we will start to see um, um, uh, reducing overall the amount of cost that comes with those two different, um, uh, two different um, mechanisms, markets. 
That's the first one. The second one is I wanted to come back to um, uh, uh, Tina Clement's uh, original question on the EHCP uh, um, plans. Um, there is a lovely slide which shows uh, uh, the volumes going up and the performance consistently going down. And I think we've been bottom lining for the last six or nine months in terms of the percentage that we turn, turn through. Um, so I, I guess my first question is, um, given that um, the HCP is a, um, is, a, um, is, a national, is a statutory requirement, um, at what stage uh, will we get to hitting the designated performance from the centre? Um, because obviously these charts only look backwards. Um, and second of all, what do you recommend to those parents who are desperate uh, to, um, um, to have the best for their children um, and aren't receiving their annual reviews um, because they're not being delivered? Uh, thank you. Um, the reducing, uh, the, the home care versus care home uh, issue is one that um, I'm quite keen on making sure that people can stay at home for as long as possible. Um, you know from your time in Stafford Borough Council, is that a raw nerve? Um, about the, the, the <laughs> about the, the desire to put in place disabled facilities grants to allow people to live in their homes for as long as possible. Um, I would always prefer people to be uh, to be receiving care at home if it's appropriate. Um, there, of course, comes a point where they need to move into a care home, um, and that's always a difficult decision to make. But um, I can't, I can't uh, deduce anything from the uh, trajectories, I'm afraid, Councillor Pert, and it would be inappropriate for me to speculate at this point. Um, EHCPs, uh, we, we recognise the, um, the shortfall in our ability to deliver EHCPs, so... Uh, you'll recall that uh, Cabinet approved additional funding into the into the department to recruit, I think, this requires such mental agility, this committee. You take me all over the place. Um, I think we, we set on recruiting an additional 10 educational psychologists, and I think we're just over halfway there for the number of recruits, uh, uh, new ed psychs that we've got in place, as the jargon has it. Um, and then moving on to the annual reviews that parents receive, Yes, we did need to address that, and my recollection is that we, we've recruited additional key workers into the department to make sure that that annual review happens uh, religiously. So that's, I think, my response off the top of my head, uh, but we can check in some detail that that is actually the case. I'm definitely sure we've funded additional uh, EHCPs, mm -hmm. and I'm certain, I'm, yeah, 10 key worker, yeah, 10 key workers and five ed sites. Thank you very much indeed, Lindsay. You can come again. <laughs> Councillor Pert. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for, for that answer. Um, so is there, is there an assurance that as part of those annual reviews, um, the key workers will be looking at, um, first of all, appropriateness, ongoing appropriateness, because obviously children change at a rapid rate of, uh, of knots, and second of all, actually, that the outcomes anticipated are those, an are those outcomes that are being achieved. Because if they're not, possibly the EHCP plan isn't landing on the ground where it's meant to. And I certainly am aware of a number of cases now where actually um, the problem with the EHCP plan is impacting on the child, which makes it even worse. Um. Mr Chairman, it is my good fortune to have Lindsay sat next to me because Lindsay's previous job was in children's services here at Staffordshire County Council. Lindsay, would you like to answer that question? I'll, I'll certainly try. So, so from knowledge, the, the Children's Improvement Board in Staffordshire County Council holds all of the conversation that we've, we've just been talking about to account. So what, what I'm mindful of is, is that board particularly focuses on deep dives into absolutely these areas. Unfortunately, I, I can't give you the information because I don't attend them boards anymore, but my understanding is that's absolutely the place where these conversations are taking place, particularly around annual reviews, uh, timeliness of EHCPs, uh, and as Councillor White's just said, um, the improvement plan uh, to increase in these. So I would need to go back and check on what the plan around specifically around annual annual reviews are because I'm I'm mindful that's not drawn out in that detail in the report councillor. 
Councillor Pert. Thank you, uh, Chair. So, it, 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 with that answer, are you suggesting it might be appropriate to refer the concerns I have and the questions I have to uh, the uh, Children's uh, Improvement Board? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one um, reoccurring or repeating theme that seems to be going through in relation to um, health and care is around recruitment and retention. And it seems as though we're, we are seem to be going through an exercise to try and get more people and, and the people that we have to retain them um, and there are plans afoot. I just wonder whether there's any, any comments as to where we are in relation to that work and whether or not we still have um, a number of vacancies in key areas. Uh, thank you Chairman. Yes, that, um, uh, those gaps have been uh, identified and tackled through um, Councillor Jessel's work as a portfolio holder. She's created a um, recruitment strategy the yeah social for the so social care workforce recruitment strategy um, so that we are tackling directly that issue thank you councillor perry Th thank you chairman and uh, congratulations on your new role <laughs> um mine's a little bit similar but it's more on the adult social care side i'm moving to now if that's okay yeah yeah um the same applies to that um, recruiting for ass assessments I'm talking about now for adult social care. I wonder if I've missed it somewhere, um, if there's not somewhere we could find a paper that would let us know what we, um, how many we're down, because we're using temporary, according to the reading, we're using temporary, which costs a lot more money. Um, so I just wondered if there was some sort of uh, paper somewhere that we could know what kind of recruitments um, we're making and, as, and or not, as the case might be, uh, because we're an ageing population and these are only going to get worse if they need that care, or, or the older people. They need assessing now so that p things can be put in place which may save us money in the long term. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, the, the, uh, sorry, Mr Chairman, can I answer that? Yeah. yeah. Um, Councillor Perry, there is a cabinet paper on that precise issue, which I think has been through Councillor Pert's committee, um, which is um, we, we can obviously share for you. It's in the public domain. Um, but you do, you do make a, a very good point about the ageing population and the challenge of caring for the ageing population. We, we do tend to spend time thinking about what artificial intelligence can do and robots and all this sort of stuff, but the caring profession is one which requires human interaction. Uh, and so how we actually tackle that uh, and um, how we give people dignified and meaningful lives uh, when they're older and they do need care is something that I think everybody uh, involved in that sector is spending quite a lot of time thinking about. Um, so it's a really important point and um, we can share that document with you so you can take a look. Did you want to come back, Councillor Perry? Anybody else want to move on to economy, infrastructure and skills? Any areas of that people want to comment on or challenge? I'll perhaps start, I'll perhaps start with a, a question in relation to um, the five-year five extension with Amy um, um, and how that's going and the perception whether or not we're seeing any difference or, and the, the standard improving and, and the fact we're, we're bringing back the inspectors in-house. Um, just an update, really, um, and how do we monitor that, and how are we monitoring that going forward with the work that we're doing in the highways? Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. It's a, it's a very important point for the hundreds of thousands of people that live in this county, uh, the state of the roads. Um, with that, I was able to meet with the managing director of AMI, the, the overall managing director of the entire company, last week. Um, we spent an hour together just talking about the expectations of Staffordshire County Council um, in particular, some of the, um, what, what I think is, wouldn't be unreasonable to describe as some of the nonsense that goes on around uh, spray painting a series of potholes that are all next to each other, instead of stripping out the entire patch of road and saying, you know what, um, that entire patch of road needs to have a single patch, because otherwise the lots of mini patches, they, they um, get undermined. Uh, the managing director is very clear about um, what his company needs to do in order to deliver for Staffordshire. We're an important contract for him. Uh, we're, we're one of a, a few county councils that has a contract with Amy, Kent being another, uh, and they're, key, they're clearly keen to retain good customer service. 
I was very keen to make the point to him about the additional funding that's gone into uh, highways, and it's just important to remind ourselves that we have a budget for highways, which I think is 60-something million pounds, and we've put an additional 15 million pounds on top of that. Uh, so this is a you know, serious sum of money, and it's important to Amy that they deliver uh, effectively on that. I was very clear with him about the, the need to make sure that we are getting value for money for that, um, for that additional money uh, over and above that that we've already budgeted. His response was, well, actually, the buying power that Amy has and the partnerships they have with, with um, other large aggregate providers means that they can get a very good rate for uh, chippings and bitumen and those things that are needed to repair roads, and I was glad to hear that. Bringing some stuff in-house has been a way of making sure that Amy doesn't mark its own homework. Um, so when we have an inspector going out to check the roads, uh, it isn't an Amy inspector checking the roads, it's a Staffordshire County Council inspector. I do think that there is work to be done from our side, as well as on the Amy side, to make sure that our teams are managing the Amy contract as effectively as they could do. Um, that's that first part. The second is communications. Um, it is clear to me, and it's clear, I suspect, to everybody in this room, that the communications with um, highways maintenance and citizens of Staffordshire and county councillors of Staffordshire is not as good as it could be. There are, there are very good reasons for that to be improved because people don't like being kept in the dark, and that's entirely reasonable. So to that end, the comms team has been reconfigured uh, to make sure that there is a, a dedicated comms member of staff dealing specifically with highways and also comes from Amy to highlight those areas where the work is going well and also acknowledge those areas where things aren't going so well. So that's the, the comms part. And there was another part that I just wanted to talk about, but I can't quite recall what it was. Um, no, I can't remember what it was. <coughs> so um, what, was your what was your initial question? I've, I've, I've lost my thread, Chairman. Yes. Yes, uh, and that's the, that's the other thing about the new contract with Amy that I, I made clear to the managing director of Amy uh, the other day, which was, look, when we when the Conservatives took control of Staffordshire in 2009, we looked at the highways contract, and it was run at that time for those that were members of the county council by a company called Enterprise, and I think we come to the conclusion that the Enterprise contract had run its course and therefore we needed a new contract. So we went with Amy. Um, for those of us who had high expectations of the Amy contract, you'd expected to see a whole new bunch of people turning up and everything would be great. Instead of which, of course, everybody gets stupid across <laughs> to the new company and you're there uh, with exactly the same person sitting in front of you going, oh, you're back, you're wearing a different logo. Um, and so it's the management of the, of the business that's the important thing uh, not the, the personalities necessarily that are involved in it. So um, I, I'm aware that should we uh, decide to change contractor, um, then, of course, everybody will get stupid across, and if you think it's the personality issue, that's not going to change. It's the, it's the management of the contract and the delivery of the contract is the key thing. However, the nature of the contract has changed to allow us to intervene uh, much more efficiently than we... Oh, in fact, we've got the chairman of the scrutiny committee. She knows all the answers to this and probably could give the same answer, but better than the one I'm just giving. Uh, so we're able to much more uh, flexibly manage the contract uh, from the point at which it was re-signed and moving forward over the next five years. I think this is a much, much better contract than we had previously. We've made changes to enable communications to improve. They understand the need for fixing strips of road rather than just ad hoc potholes. And I'm hopeful, fingers crossed. And I've said, I said very clearly last week that very important that some of this is got to really start making a difference to our highways. And just just to come back with a point for your leader, just in relation to the to the, the fifteen million that we additionally that we put in, are we seeing results coming from that? Are we seeing a difference that that's making to our road in Staffordshire? Yes, the number of potholes that we're fixing per year has increased dramatically from where we were. Um, 14 years ago. However, there's more potholes to fix. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, that's a fact. I think Mr. Eberly's highlighting he wants to speak. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Um, should I note um, that a car that's been parked in Tipping Street with the registration VK17LFV has left the lights on? I don't know if that's anybody in this room, but you might want to know. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Yates. Yes, thank you, Chair. If you don't mind, I'd like to raise uh, two points. Uh, the first one, just referring to the fact that the 14 household waste recycling centres, the management has come back in the house. I do note that on Sunday the 18th of June, Environment Minister Rebecca Powell has announced that council DIY waste charges are abolished. That seems a very definite full stop immediacy of statement. Uh, I know that our local uh, site reopens tomorrow after being closed on uh, Monday and Tuesday. I presume that means that there will be no charges for DIY waste being uh, imposed on our residents with immediate effect. That's pretty much what this statement from the uh, Ministry of the Environment does say. Uh, and secondly, coming back to Amy, Amy, I presume, was selected on the basis of her expertise, innovation, buying power, a wide range of plants which would exceed anything a individual council like Staffordshire would have. So therefore you get the benefit of not just uh, economy of scale, but the fact that they are at the white heat coal face of innovation to make sure jobs and tasks are done properly. which. Brings me on to a disappointment that one of the major investments in Biddulph and on the A523, uh, it's uh, just outside water houses, uh, significant areas have been repaired, not with plant and machinery, but with the truck ch turning up a wheelbarrow and a rake and a hand roller. And it turns out this morning, I did have an update after various uh, overtures going into the highways department. It turns out that these repairs were done with the wrong method methodology in error and they will be stripped back and redone correctly with tarmac lane machines. Now the issue I've got with that is A, how would such a competent agreement and competent multinational company get in that position that they don't assess what's required before they actually do the job? But secondly, there now seems to be a hiatus in continuing with those repairs because the plant, because they will be done and reworked as plant and machinery becomes available. So this brings on another point of this extra money. Does Amy have the capacity to spend this extra money within the time scale which is required to put right the major projects uh, which are wrong? Now, I have to say, I did pick up a lot of noise off social media I didn't need that noise because I'd already picked up the fact that my teeth were chattering when I was going over the uh, superbly hand-laid corrugated tarmac, which they seem to have got as a job lot. And I was on the case with the uh, highways team. And uh, I insisted that they do the inspection to make sure that it is done right. And granted, they have done that, so it is in the process of being done right. It shouldn't have been done wrong in the first place for the reasons which I said. You know, this is supposed to be a competent business and you're supposed to assess what, what, what is needed. But obviously, you know, that, that is the case. And a second point related to this, as I was out with a team of strategic highway officers looking at my, spending my DHB money on a whole village solution to traffic calming and issues, and I raised the point about repairing potholes which were in the immediate, and I really do mean the immediate, within a single foot pace of a, of a pothole repair. And I complained that some which were done the previous week before, one tiny patch, 12 inches square, was repaired, and there was patches either side not repaired. I mentioned the whole place policy, they'd never heard of it, and that was our divisional team. So the serious, there does seem to be a serious communication issue because, again, straight away, the team of local inspectors, which is Facebook, were certainly on my case to say, how can they repair that and leave, within the same photograph, four potholes of a similar ilk? You know, probably one centimetre, not quite so deep. So that's, they're the issues which we really need to raise to get on top of making sure that Amy delivers. Uh, thank you. Um, as far as the charges are concerned at household waste recycling centres, um, 
my recollection is that if somebody's just rocking up with a bit of DIY stuff to put in the tip, it's you still carry on in. Um, I, I don't. I think you get charged. You, get, you can buy a permit for uh, if you're going to be going in 12 times a year, and you're going in in a van. But if you're going in with with a bit of DIY waste, I don't think. I'm um, looking at uh, Councillor Clements, who went through this in some detail. I don't think you get charged. Some authorities do, but I don't think we do. We do. Yeah, Councillor Clements. Yeah, Chair, uh, Councillor Yates. The charges apply, as Councillor White has just said, to vans going in. So we, um, well, if, I can see you shaking your head. That's something that needs to be taken up outside of this meeting. But the the charges apply to the the like the waste traders that go in and doing house clearances and stuff like that to prevent people from outside of our county from coming in and tipping waste. If you rock up in your little Ford Fiesta with a bit of bathroom waste, you can tip with no charge. So if you're telling me that there's a charge being applied at the Waste Disposal Centre, I presume it's Newcastle. No. no. Which one? Uh, right, okay. That's something we need to take up outside of this meeting because there should be no charges to an individual. It's, it's a trade permit that's chargeable. Um, and if I can just come back on the um, on the um, the transformation we've done with highways, um, just to back up Councillor White, yes, inspectors have come back into house, and we are seeing a much bigger difference. Um, the place repairs should be happening, and if you're telling me that your highways team, your DHP managers, don't know about that, um, that's again something we need to take up with Councillor Williams because they were all briefed at the same time, and quite extensively as well. You know, they had the same briefing seminar that we did as members. So I'm not quite sure where the communication breakdown's been there, but they were all briefed at the same time. Um, value for money and the Amy contract, as Councillor White has said, we can look, that's, that's assessed on a year by year. So if we're not happy, we can call it in on a yearly basis and say, you know, we need these changes to happen. These 10 year contracts, that they, they no longer exist anymore. We have to be more on the ball. We have to be monitoring more of what's going on. And if people aren't happy, the biggest the biggest issue what I had when we spoke to the, the, the um, area managers, uh, obviously mine's uh, Gary Hunt, is that members are not engaging. They're not asking them where they want their DHP money to be spent. And some councillors don't even meet with their DHP managers. So it's a plea. Please, please, please engage with your managers because they're the ones that can get the work done for you. Um, and I think Councillor White's looked at it. The other thing I was going to say, we're looking at where um, they're called gangs, where the gangs travel from. I had a repair done in Tamworth in my division and the gang had travelled from Stoke-on-Trent. It's not really efficient when we're looking at making savings and uh, our carbon footprint as well. So, thank you, Chair. Yes, Leader. Yeah, Mr Chairman, um, I stand corrected on the charges. Okay, so th there are some charges in here. Um, I don't know what the implications are. I'll pick it up with the portfolio holder um, as soon as. So, um, it's yet again, of course, it's, um, and I'm, I'm gonna have to make this criticism, it's government imposing upon local authorities additional costs because that stuff has to go somewhere. Uh, there is a charge for doing it. And I wonder if whether, whether or not government is going to provide us with the covering the costs of these new uh, burdens once again that, um, that just are done by fiat. So I'll thank you for raising that, uh, Councillor Yates. I will get into further detail about that in due course. Uh, to your point about um, the potholes that you're referring to, um, I can't talk in, in about any details of any potholes, and I, I'd really rather this committee didn't descend into uh, a, a pothole fest because it, people say, oh, 11 Acacia Avenue, we, are you aware that, that pothole wasn't filled incorrectly? No, I wasn't, okay? And I can't, we cannot spend the entire meeting, these entire meetings going through individual cases. It's disappointing to hear that uh, this particular incident that you've referred to, uh, if it's as you've described, then that's not acceptable and that goes against what the uh, managing director of Amy told me that would happen. So I, I do hope that we start to see some improvements in performance um, the, the work done in error has a cost. That's the thing that really hacks me off. We've paid for it once, and we're going to have to pay for it to be done again. Uh, and I expect that these things, uh, these things are sorted out right first time. Um, Councillor Heath is, a, is uh, somebody who's, who's had 
I, I can't say, I was gonna say had a pants pulled down, but the, the uh, DHP problems with asking for a piece of work to be done, feasibility study costs about the same as the entire budget for a DHP. Yeah. So things like that are things that really are, are not acceptable, we do need to attend to. Um, I take your point about charges at H uh, HWRC, I'll pick it up. Um, but the, in general, um, hearing what you've just described on those potholes is disappointing and we will work to resolve it. Councillor, is it come back if it's, on, if it's in relation to the report as opposed to a Yes, absolutely. Personal. It is relation to the report because it's relation to the, the, to the method of management and the method of inspection. What I illustrated by mentioning a specific instance is to ensure that I had, in, that I had correct and up-to-date and relevant information to demonstrate the failure at this moment in time in management practices. And as far as I'm concerned, I am scrutinizing the, uh, AME con the delivery of the AMI contract and the management from Staffordshire, Mo Staffordshire County Council to ensure that that is done properly by giving real time, real examples of problems which we are experiencing. I'm sure we're experiencing those problems around the county. So what I want to ensure is that Amy, don't just turn up to a job willy-nilly. They actually structure and plan. I mean, these jobs are notified uh, well in advance. The, the finance is notified well in advance. The, the marking up is notified well in advance. Surely they should have the appropriate equipment, the appropriate specification with the appropriate equipment, with the appropriate manning to uh, spend the funding which has been applied for to them, and then that should be picked up by the in inspector. And that is what I am picking up. I am citing specific examples, and not just in my town, but in the wider area, where that obviously has fell down and hasn't happened. And I just want to make sure that this committee is aware of it, that those who are responsible for the management of that contract are aware of that something that we need to pick up and go forward to make sure that it doesn't happen. Because in some instances, these roads okay, are Councilor, being repaired I think after. Yeah, I think we've, we've got the gist of it. You've made your point, yeah. Leader. Um, it is a valid point, but if you make the point repeatedly, repeatedly and more forcibly, it doesn't reiterate the point. It's just making the same point a second time. I got it. I got it first time. So um, I, I, I'm taking note, and I will. Uh, I'll move forward with it. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Um, yesterday on the news, there was a, pro, um, a clip about the abuse that the council workers um, receive from residents. Is there anything that we do in this area? This was Birmingham, and I'm not explaining myself very well, sorry. What happens is they go out, they fix the road, but they receive a lot of abuse from the public. Like somebody had a knife held to his throat if he didn't move his car out the way and stuff like that. I just wonder if our teams suffer like that and is there any record of it? Nothing's been reported to me, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Heath. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, just to go back to Amy and the contract, they have the contract for the whole of Staffordshire. My simple mind, if we had two contracts, one for the south and one for the north, wouldn't it introduce a little bit of competition with the Amy and whoever so that they could keep the costs more reasonable? You know, they've got their own way, haven't they? I, I just have two and introduce the competition with them, keep them on their toes, but I'm hard. Did you want to come back to Spot the farmer. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> um, it's a point you've made before. Um, of course, having two contracts requires two sets of contract management, um, which would be create additional administrative challenge. But I'll ask the portfolio holder to take a look at it and see if he has, um, if he has an answer. To, to give you an idea of how important, um, obviously politically, the highways is uh, to us, um, I brought in um, Councillor Pritchard as the Cabinet Support Member for Highways to give a bit of oomph to uh, the work that's going on in highways because I know that um, uh, the portfolio holder is inundated with stuff all the time and in order to make sure we're delivering for our residents and for our councillors in particular uh, on the points that you've just made, uh, Councillor Yates, these issues are important. Um, we need to be listening to that, absorbing those, those points, then analysing what it actually means in terms of the management of the highway contract, because what Councillor Yates described is, is the symptom of a problem and getting underneath that, and it's the way people relate their problems, um, getting underneath that and what that actually means is something that's very important to us, and that's the reason why I brought in additional political heft to cover that. Um, but 
I, I will ask them to take another look at it, um, Councillor Heath. Councillor Perry, you just wanted to com comment just, on... Just to make a comment on what <laughs> Councillor e, um, Yes, Jill, Jill Heath just said. Um, I don't actually think it would work because the competition might be again about the companies, but the councillors wouldn't be very happy on that one. If, if they were working much better in the north of the county as opposed to the south and vice versa, it would be cause a lot of um, um, contention, for the want of a better word, sorry. Councillor Pert. Thank you, Mr Chairman. And um, I'm just going to go in a slightly different direction, but on highway still. But let me just pick up Jill Hilly's uh, last point um, and what Councillor uh, Kath Perry has just said. Um, I, I wonder whether the split is actually not geographically, but by capital um, programmes versus routine uh, highways uh, maintenance and repair. I wonder. But um, um, uh, uh, let me just start on the on the uh, on the big picture. Uh, I, I think this report is really good because it allows you to link a whole range of different items. Um, and I'm going to try and do that if you don't mind, uh, Chair. So um, I'm going to preface my comments by saying actually maybe the issue is I live in a rural area and we have so many more roads than many other members because of the geographical patch. But I do feel that. Uh, um, either I'm disadvantaged alongside other rural members, and there are a few in this room, um, or, or, or whether there's something more sy sy symptomatic. Um, I just want to start with page 33, where it talks about Staffordshire's performance continues to be above the benchmarks for all defective repairs. That statement, I think, unfortunately, um, whilst it relates to emergency repairs, Cat 1s and Cat 2s, I think probably would um, not be something that many of my residents um, and many of Staffordshire's residents would necessarily associate with. Uh, and I wonder whether there's a perception versus reality problem within this. The second point I just want to make is the um, slide underneath it, the graph underneath it, talks about, um, and I've just lost it, um, talks about, <laughs> just bear with me while I find my page again. Which page was I on? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, it talks about total number of safety defects, including Cat 3s. It doesn't necessarily show the ones that are outstanding. It just shows those that have been identified. Um, so actually, I, I'm not sure it tells me as much as, uh, because in the end, if you're only fixing one a month of the Cat 3s, um, or maybe you're fixing uh, 2,000 a month, you, you can't tell that in terms of what the outstanding volume of, of, of road repairs are. Because if I'm a resident and I fall into the same pothole day in, day out, I get a perception in terms of, and perception is reality for those residents. Um, let me just go in a different direction, if I may, uh, as well, then. Um, the... Um, uh, on page, um, on page, uh, let me get this right, 55, there is a whole section on uh, highways. Just let me go to it. I will get there. Which you may not be on page 55. Um, but the point I wanted to make there was um, there is some figures there. Um, that suggests that, yes, here it is. Um, no, not that one. Um, I, 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 um, paragraph 182. Um, uh, it talks about a reduction in spend due to the rephasing of the SWA, the uh, Stafford Western Access Road, but equally slippage of carriageway investments and minor carriageway slippage repairs of 2.7 million. If I was a resident and I'm suffering falling into the same pothole, I think I might be a tad upset um, that Amy hadn't actually spent the money that we've given them. And I wonder whether um, the speed of delivery is part of the problem. I have schemes that go on for four years on DHP. I have schemes where I'm trying to get some, some, some potholes fixed, and they take a year. And... I, I wonder whether this is a cultural issue um, that slippage is acceptable and second of all that it, it's acceptable to, 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 to allow things just to drift in, 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 in inevitably down a route because the longer something sits there the more it becomes a category two or a category one and costs more money to go and repair it because we have to send out emergency crews. Um, and I, I, I wonder whether we are going to hit this year's capital spend, given the additional monies that Amy have been given. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll answer this last point first. Uh, these are capital schemes. They're not highways maintenance you're referring to. Pay, paragraph 182. So, so it, it, it's, it's, it's a project that has slipped, um, but it is not highways maintenance. So you're connecting two unconnected things. So the pothole repairs are not part of this. Uh, that said, uh, I have picked up the slippage with the portfolio holder, and we've had a um, direct conversation about it. Um, it isn't acceptable to have the slippage. I've made that point very clear to the team. Uh, they need to get that back on track. I think there are five projects uh, in the pipeline at the moment. One is on schedule, four aren't. That needs to be addressed. But it's, these are capital schemes, not maintenance. Um, when you're referring to your um, the graph on page 33, um, which is the total number of safety de defects identified, just to your point about the representation you have there. Um, of course, you'll have noticed that the, um, the x-axis is dates, is months of the year. Uh, it isn't possible to identify category three potholes uh, during the worst of the winter for the simple reason that it's difficult to see them because the roads are wet. Uh, and so you, th those category three potholes are particularly difficult to identify when you've got wet roads and in addition to that, the teams are deployed gritting roads um, and prioritising road safety during that particular period of time. So that, again, that's a, that's a um, an issue that's related. Well, not again. That is an issue that's related to the time of year as opposed to uh, the number of defects that are being identified. What was your What was your other point? Sorry, I've forgotten. Yeah, spectrum versus yeah uh, of course. Um, for us to stand up and say, actually, Staffordshire is doing a lot better than other places, people don't see that at all. They just want to know that their roads are in a good in good nick, and some people don't feel that that is the case. I get that. That's the reason why we put our money where our mouth is. If we said actually um, everything's rosy in the garden, we wouldn't be increasing the budget in highways by 15 million pounds. What we're saying is that there is a problem, and we are we are tackling it. We want to make sure that Amy is spending that money wisely. We don't want to hear things that Councillor Yates has, has identified. That's unacceptable. That needs to be resolved because what's the point of putting additional money in if we can have another go of it? To your point about um, the sort of rural, um, rural urban split, uh, just speak to Councillor Oates outside the room and, tell, and, and get him to tell you your story, his stories about how he perceives Tamworth Roads um, because Councillor Oates and his, and, and his colleagues let me know about Tamworth Roads all the time. Um, so, so it's not just a rural road issue. It is, it is a, it's roads that need addressing across the county. That's the reason why we're putting additional money in, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, can I move us on to um, corporate services on page 20? Um, and the council's aim to raise eight million through the sale of, of unused land and buildings. It says that, unfortunately, due to complexities, um, we were not able to raise that figure a figure of, um, I think we sold four sites. So I just wanted some reassurance that we're still on course to sell the remaining um, land and buildings to raise the remainder of that eight million pounds in the, uh, the next financial year. We have a very good track record in, in this area, Mr. Chairman, uh, and sometimes we do get a bit of slippage because as you know, those negotiations that take place between purchaser and vendor sometimes get drawn out a little bit. You have the um, complexity of section 106 section 278 requirements to resolve in some of these cases we do get uh, developers who um, obviously you think you've got the deal uh, you think they've got the financial assembly in place and then all of a sudden it falls away so you have to go again back out to market but in general we have remained on track and it has been a very successful program uh, over the past several years now uh, giving uh, yielding up funds for our, uh, funding our services Thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Pert. I, was, I wasn't quite ready for that. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, I notice under paragraph 159 uh, that finance has moved out of corporate services and is now its own standalone directorate. Is that a reversal of what was um, undertaken about three years ago, uh, first of all? Um, and second of all, uh, could we just look at the uh, individual debt um, as part of care, uh, the health and care client debt? Because I noticed that effectively, you know, the increase in debt, and, and obviously no one wants to be in that position of, uh, of needing uh, health and care. 
uh, or care, certainly. Um, and, and it's obviously a worrying time for many families. Um, but I, I noticed that the overperformance of the health bodies and CCGs uh, is matched by the underperformance in recovering some of the um, debt that's there. But maybe my original point right at the outset of this conversation about maybe there is a shift out of residential care homes into home care might be part of some of the answer that's there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I think the financial management of a local authority is very, very important indeed. Uh, and so uh, I've had the opportunity to reconfigure senior leadership teams so that the um, finance directorate becomes a standalone directorate because it, previously it was reporting through the uh, director of corporate services into the chief executive uh, and then t to myself. Um, I want a direct line to the finance director because money's key. In any other walk of life, in my business life, the first item on a board meeting is finance. Because without money, you're stuffed, aren't you? So I, I, I wanted to raise the profile of the finance directorate uh, by making sure that that person is a senior leadership team member with equal status to all the other senior leadership team members to enable um, uh, meaningful conversations to take place. That's not to say meaningful conversations weren't taking place, but that direct line of sight is something I wanted to establish. That's the reason for that. Uh, the client debt in, in health and care is something that Councillor Jessel has uh, very much cottoned onto and is looking at ways of trying to reduce that, that client debt. Uh, one of the challenges that we have is when somebody needs, needs a package of care, what, you, what, what we have tended to do is say, you need a package of care, we put it in place, and then all of a sudden we come in later and say, oh, by the way, there is a charge associated with this and by which time the debt is already accumulated, and that's very difficult to recover that debt, whereas if you were able to start paying from the start, you pay as you go. Um, that's being addressed now. Um, may I suggest uh, through you, Mr Chairman, that Councillor Pert, through his committee, perhaps wants to interrogate that a little further. Um, well, it's your, it's your bailiwick, um, because it, it is an important point, and it is a large sum of money, and some of that, some of that money you know, it's going to be very difficult indeed to recover, so we need to have a clear-eyed view about you know, what is recoverable and what isn't. Did you want to come back? Thanks, Bert. Anybody else in relation to the report you have in front of you? Any more comments anywhere? I mean, clearly, the actor and summary uh, and, and the, the ratings that are there Obviously, children's and families are the, are the area that we're really concerned about, and I'm sure that's the same for many authorities up and down the country. And the pressures will, will no doubt increase. They won't get any better. Um, and there's a clear message to government that we need to make sure that funding is allocated to these areas. Um, <coughs> only last week at the um, Council of Form of the LGA, uh, we had Michael Gove there, and many leaders were talking to them, him about multi-year settlement, about proper settlement in relation to children, adult children's services, adult social care, and there needs to be a proper framework put in place to fund these areas because councils can't keep continuing to deliver the services that we do given the resources we have. And, and clearly, if you look at the, the um, overspend on children and families, it, it's going in the wrong direction and, and it is going to be a, a, a big pressure for this authority going forward. So the, the, the bulk of the report, I, I feel, is, is very good uh, and we're, we're coming out well in lots of areas, but the challenges are certainly around those areas, and I'm sure the chairs of the committees that deal with that will no doubt want to keep a, a, a close eye on, on developments and how that goes and, and how that affects our finances going forward. So thank you very much for coming and giving the report. The, the recommendation for us was to the committee members note and challenge performance, which I think we've done, and advise any further information and or action required. Are we happy that we've done that to, to its performance this morning and we can move on to the next item? Note. Item. Sorry, I won't use the word note. Other than bank notes, that I, I still have a few of, even though we're not in that society anymore, are we? Anyway, that's a different story. So thank you very much indeed, Leader, for, for that, very, for that uh, report this morning. So shall we move on to the next item then, please, which is item number five on the agenda, which is the annual overview and scrutiny report. Um, and this is a report um, by our previous chair of the role I'm in now, Councillor Colin Greatrix. I can't think of a time um, before out of the local authority where I've had my picture 
on the front of a report. Other than when I was uh, teaching some children about um, the Christingle service and the Church of England Children's Society work that I'm involved in, was my picture on the front of the report. So we haven't got that. But if I can draw your attention just to parts of that report, please, some highlights that I just wanted to pick out from that. On page 70 of the report, and I'll wait for you to, uh, to get that before I start commenting any further. Um, it's often difficult, I think, to demonstrate the tangible outcomes of scrutiny work. However, this page highlights the hidden benefits of scrutiny, which is about building relationships, raising awareness, holding the difficult conversations, uh, looking at things from different perspectives and looking at how others do things, um, processes and decisions that are made. And on page 71, I'll just draw your attention to the fact that we have looked at a total of 100 topics um, during the last 12 months uh, in their 36 formal meetings this last year. Uh, in addition to that, working groups, inquiry days and site visits add depth and context to our scrutiny work. And then on page 72, um, following on to the end of the report, provides a summary from each of the committees of the work and the committees have carried out and where scrutiny has made a difference. And I wanted to thank the chairs and the vice chairs of all those committees for the work that you have done. It now gives us the opportunity and members to make any alterations or changes to that report before it goes to full council in July, where my, my deputy, Jill, will be presenting the report because I shall be on holiday in sunny Cornwall. <laughs> so I'll open it up to members to make comments on, on their report or their particular part of the annual report. Councillor Clement. Um, I'm really happy with uh, the work that obviously Prosperous Overview and Scrutiny have done. And we managed to get um, a working group and inquiry day about the civil enforcement, but um, not wanting to go into any detail because it's there for you all to read. Um, the work that's been done, not as, as you've just said, 100 topics and the amount of meetings we've had. Prosperous has had 25 meetings and those three of those were extra. So I just wanted to place on record the work that the scrutiny managers do. Um, because without Jonathan, sometimes we would lose our way, especially with some of the members that sit on Prosperous Overview and Scrutiny. I won't name any names. Um, so sometimes it's quite difficult to keep track, and Jonathan does an amazing job. Um, and obviously to Chris and his team for, for the work that they do. So, yeah, without wanting to go into detail in my specific report, I'm really happy with what's in front of us. Thank you, Councillor Clements. You're absolutely right. We only get this work done with the support of our officers. Uh, and they really are first class, and we do thank them all for the, the diligence and work, the work they do. Um, Councillor Perth, did you want to make any comments on your report? Well, given the elo eloquent um, uh, start on, on, uh, from my colleague, I, I suppose I ought to. I, I would also like to um, uh, thank uh, the scrutiny officers uh, led by Deb Breeden uh, and Zach Simister um, for the work they've done, um, and also congratulate uh, Deb on her appointment as a scrutiny manager. Um, I'm not going to pick up the individual areas, um, apart from saying um, that on the, a number of the key issues that concern the residents of Staffordshire, you know, primary care access, system pressures, the ambulance service, um, we've been ahead of the game. And I think, to me, that is a good demonstration of good scrutiny. Um, the health and care system in the UK is really complex. Um, and anyone who says that it isn't and can easily navigate their own way through it, um, I, I think would be taking an overtly simplistic position or alternatively, they've never tried it. Um, and so as a result, some of the work that he's done to, um, and, and, and the other thing I should say is the system is changing as we speak into integrated care systems and new partnerships and new ways of working. Um, and it is a, a really important role for us to help the future strategy of the NHS and our care partners to ensure that we actually do take the opportunities that sit in front of us. And I, I, I think the committee has been doing that I hope that we will continue to do more of that, particularly with the work with our districts and borough colleagues. Um, there has been a, a relatively wholesale change of uh, representation. For some reason or other, I can't think why. Um, and, and I think that it gives us an opportunity to, to look at that preventative agenda and not to look at health and care as the moment we need the front door of a hospital or a care home. Thank you, Chair.
Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on the on the annual report? No. Okay, that's fine then. So um, we'll move on to item six, which is the overview and scrutiny work program 23-24. Um, drawing your attention to some parts in this report, if I can. Um, the report provides a summary of the scrutiny activity between Jan and April of this year. Um, and the work that we plan to carry out in the first quarter of 23-24. At paragraph 11, um, it, 13 meetings looking at 13 meetings looking at 38 different reports. The summary of what was looked at is summarised in the annual report. Paragraph 12, last year the chairs and vice chairs form considered working arrangements, scrutiny mechanisms and processes and will continue to consider what we do and, and how we can improve scrutiny in the forthcoming year. And, and I do know that the, the leader referred back to a, a, a conversation that I had with him, a, a Teams meeting with him, where we talked about some of the issues that we brought up in the, in the forum, um, the chairs and vice chairs that we had in relation to attendance at scrutiny meetings um, by certain members of the cabinet. That's been taken forward, but we've also tried to put in the, the diary a date for the chairs to get together uh, and then to attend um, a cabinet meeting um, or the first part of the cabinet meeting, just to put our, our points across so that they get the message first hand from us of exactly what the situation is and, and where and the direction in which we're going. Uh, and we're certainly going to be looking at putting together, with your support, um, a scrutiny protocol that we can all work to. Um, and part of that is, is, is being cleverer and is, is looking at what we're going to be putting in our forward plan going forward. And you all as, as chairs and vice chairs will be doing that, no doubt, anyway, to make sure that we're adding value and that we actually are holding the the um, the uh, administration to account. So um, member training opportunities have been started and they will continue. Um, and there is there is a, a slight change to the health and care scrutiny training. It's actually on the 6th of July, 4.30 to 6, whilst I have you here to in, inform you of that. And will be a virtual uh, session. So uh, any comments at all on the first quarter from anybody on the um, work programme? Update. We're all happy with the, the way in which that is proceeding. Okay. Um, we'll move on to item seven if we can then. This is the work program and the planning. Work planning. Mandy, do you want to come in here a bit with the with the planning and the work program? Uh, yes, through. thank you, Chair. Um, this is the draft work program for the next twelve months. Um, what I've I've done is um, looked at the items that you've requested over the last 12 months to come back, update reports like the you meet the LEP in January, those sort of annual reports, complaints, annual reports. I've also slotted in the, the regular quarterly updates like you, uh, the integrated performance and the finance reports. Uh, this really is an opportunity for you to um, decide if you still want all the, of those reports, whether there's anything that you want to look at in more depth that isn't included. The, the chairman and vice chairs do have a triangulation meeting with the leader and cabinet members next week, so more items of business might come, come to light uh, then. But this, this really is your opportunity to say whether you're happy with the draft as it stands, whether there's something else that you want to look at or things have moved on and there are things that you don't want to look at anymore that are in there. Thank you for that, Man Mandy. Um, and of course, it's a moving piece. So if we, if we find there's, there's areas that you want to sort of look at that aren't on the work programme, there's no, no reason to say we can't include those in at any particular time or, to, or take something out. So it's just a matter of making sure that we are in your areas covering all the, those um, parts that you want us to make sure that uh, in your committee that you're doing that. So. On that basis, are we happy with, with the work, work program that we... Chairman, did you want to speak or... Thank you. Uh, if, if I may, um, just in terms of the work program uh, and the principles that Alan brought when he became leader, uh, overview and scrutiny for 20-odd years, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, since the modernisation agenda came in, we've been desperately, desperately trying to hold cabinets to account and we've missed the overview and the policy development role that scrutiny has. Um, and I'm looking at the, the work programme, and I appreciate it's start of the year. I believe work programmes should be drawn out of the quarterly performance reports in terms of the scrutiny element, 
But in terms of the overview and policy development thing, uh, I think it's got down as, uh, as, as Keith Luscombe and, and uh, Chris Ebley in the second page have highlighted it, the leaders board for Staffordshire uh, and how we scrutinise that and how we, we key into that. And it's not because I'm a former leader that's desperately trying to keep hold of uh, my influence on that board. Uh, it's, um, I think it's crucial that we key into that because some of the stuff they're dealing with in terms of climate change, in terms of uh, promoting Staffordshire, uh, which I know might sit with Prosperous, but those things are going on at that board and they impact on the business of Staffordshire County Council and the impact on the business of us. So whilst I don't have the answers now, I do wonder if there's some thinking we need to do about how we better engage with scrutinising that board and its direction. Also, how we feed into that board in terms of policy development. Uh, I received a phone call only yesterday afternoon asking if Staffordshire and the districts in Staffordshire are still p pursuing a, a county deal because uh, the local government chronicle were, were keen to write an article. Uh, I deferred that and deflected it and said, why are you asking me? I'm no longer of any importance. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's things like that that I think we do need to have discussions about. And what's coming through from government, it was raised earlier about, I know it was only an example, but the DIY uh, waste fees and stuff like that. We need some sort of horizon spotting of this is coming from government. How are we going to respond to this? And in doing that, we can support and challenge cabinet uh, uh, in a way that, that I think would be helpful for, for the committee. So whilst, I do, whilst that's more of a challenge, uh, Councillor Wilcox, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a question as to how can we get together and, and discuss those sorts of things and, and get those on the work plan as appropriate uh, as, as we go through the year. And yeah, points well made there. Councillor Perth. Yeah, I think they're really well made points, particularly about the, the strategy and making sure that we're anticipating what's coming down the line. Um, and in, and with, with the level of discussion today, we seem to focus around a couple of key themes that we're concerned about. Uh, one of them was highways, and I noticed that in October we've got the review of the changes made by Entrust. And I wonder whether there's a gap in that we've not really got that, you know, sort of coordinated uh, review of some of the stuff on children's services, because it's not just one area. You know, we've got concerns about EHCP and SEND, we've got concerns about transport, we've got concerns about the number of children in care. And, you know, and I think it would be uh, probably a good opportunity just to, to make sure that, you know, the county's most senior scrutiny committee um, is A, looking at the performance and are we on track, but also uh, helping some of the officers with what are the other alternatives we've seen, maybe at the LGA conference, um, maybe through uh, other discussions with um, the LGA itself or some of those other things. Um, because this is not um, the cabinet's issue, this is all of our issues, particularly as with corporate parents. Any other comments from anybody on the work, work program? I think the points you, you both made are really valid, and I think do the triangulation and the other methods, we can make sure that we are doing that and holding them to account and having the things on there that we can make a difference to and, and make recommendations for. So, no, I'm fully supportive of uh, both what you've said there. Um, so, that being said, we can move on to item eight, which is the climate change working group update. Councillor Thompson. <laughs> Thank you. It's just a quick update on where we are with the working group, basically. The report before you gives a summary of where we are now and asks the corporate committee to agree to the membership of the working group for 23-24. The working group started its investigation looking at everything that the council was doing. What's more, it planned to do and created a short list of priorities. Many of the actions are underway through a variety of mechanisms across the whole of Staffordshire with the Sustainability Board was recreated and worked closely with the districts. This committee monitors the larger climate change action plan. Prosperous Committee has looked at actions under its remit, which is also a climate change action plan. And I think you do it bigger based, don't you? Including such as the EV charging, the working group for the 23-24, we've actually narrowed down what we feel is needed to be focused on for the climate change plan. Is set, now, I cannot say this word. Restoration. <laughs> Thank you. I keep getting it wrong. 
but we've, we've taken, taken carbon from the air. Initial evidence gathering identified that we have 10,000 tonnes of excess carbon and we need to move forward with planting trees, 2.5 million of them in seven years. Other mechanisms or ways to capture and store carbon may come around, but we must progress with what we know and what is available, which is what we're saying is trees. Scrutiny can ask how we can do that, when we need to do that by, and what ways are available, where we can do that, and who we would be able to move that forward. We have a tour. Thank you very much to Councillor Jeremy Pert, who has arranged it to the Norbury Park Estates Forest and the BIFOR Research Woodland, which is set within the grounds of Norbury Park, to see and hear evidence relating to the tree nurseries skills required, best practice tree planting and scientific experiments that take place on site. That is planned for the 29th of June, isn't it? Yeah. We do have people that are in the group at this moment in time. What we're asking, are those people still happy to stay within that group? We also have Connor and David Smith in the group who are not here at the moment so we can't ask them if they wish to remain in the group or not the only question i would ask now is are the team quite happy to have outside members come into the working group or would you like to keep it as just this working inside this working group kathy h yeah, I think uh, I'd be quite happy to have outside members within the working group because, to be honest, knowledge is king, and the, the more you can sort of have a, have a broad spread and bring in expertise, I think that's that, that's excellent. That's certainly how we're planning to work with uh, staff to Moulds. And I must admit, at the sustainability board meeting yesterday, I was quite pleasantly surprised just how many officers were there and how they actually completely and utterly engaged with the, with the councillors in, in a very professional but also more importantly a very proactive way yeah. you know so I think I think that's the way to go forward I mean collectively we're all in this together and collectively we all need to uh, have help to resolve it yeah I mean it certainly I was at the sustainability board yesterday on behalf of Litchfield and yes that there, there really now is a real big push and drive that we, we have to be we have to be seen to be doing more of this and certainly the working group needs to meet and needs to be part of that and driving that agenda forward so that we can make sure that we're doing all we can to to, to meet the uh, commitment that we've made of, uh, of being carbon neutral etc so we do need to do that and the visit to the policy is a good way of starting that i'm not altogether sure who was on the group or how many is on the group um at this moment in time and are you all here are they here now you have got tina jeremy bernard david smith myself connor and nigel yates Okay, and we're, go we're going to write to the the two members who are not on this committee to see if yes, they want to Yes, we are. Yes. Is everyone? I mean, are those members happy to, s to still remain on that group? Sorry. Or anybody else that we know that would want to join that group, um, particularly? It may be Philippa Hayden, but oh, okay. she may not. She's coming along for the visit, but she also has other commitments. So. Yeah. I, th I think. I agree with Councillor Yates. Yeah. If, if there are people out there who have a genuine interest in it, then I think we should be utilising them. And there's no reason to say that we can't use people outside of, of the organisation. I know us at Leachfield have two um, residents who are experts in the field of, of, of climate change and waste service and join that task group and the task group and then formulate and bring back to, to um, overview and scrutiny. So I think if we have got people that have a general interest, then I think we should be encouraging them to join us. So, so we're happy with that. I was just going to say, is everybody agreeable with that? Yeah. Well, happy. Thank okay, you. Lovely. Mine is the appointment of the members of the Medium Term Financial Strategy Working Group. Oh, this is riveting, this is. Absolutely. So Colin chaired this. I'm, I'm happy, unless anybody else wants to, to chair this working group. Um, and the membership of that, if, if the membership still wants to remain the same. Who, who was, can someone remind me, who was it? Mandy? Uh, yes, last year it was Councillors Peters, Councillor Atkins, and I'm presuming Councillor Yates would want to replace her now. Um, Councillor Pert, Councillor Heath, Councillor Thompson, and Councillor Oates. All those present happy to... The working group looking at the MTFS? 
helping to steer and show, yeah. I think we're looking to be meeting, by the sounds of it, every other Wednesday. Is that, is that seems to be the, the frequency of the meetings for this working group? I think last year, um, the weekly meetings were scheduled on the basis that it's easier to put them in at the beginning okay. and then take them out or cancel if they weren't necessary. But I think it's been mentioned that it's two weekly this time on a Wednesday. Councillor Pert. I would certainly support two weekly because otherwise we're holding slots in diaries that we're never going to use. Uh, and then it's uh, very difficult to get anything else in a diary because if everyone's holding twice the amount of slots, then, you know, it just becomes nightmarish. And I take it that we have these in person, these meetings, are they, or are they on Teams? I think last year it was a mixture of both, depending on who you were talking to and um, how flexible I'm everybody sure was. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. And I think, I think they're going to start in, do you think they're going to start in August? Is it August time they start? Sorry, man, they keep asking me all these questions. It's okay. I think, um, I think um, the, the plan was for a briefing with officers to talk about what remit you want to look at, which okay. areas, and then something will be organised okay. during, uh, usually starts end of August, beginning of September. Mm. So uh, everybody's happy with that. So just watch this space for that, for that coming forward. Okay, that's lovely. Um, item 10 is exclusion of the public. We, haven't, we don't have any items in confidential today, so uh, at whatever time it is, 11.32, um, we'll call the meeting to a close. Thank you very much for your participation this morning. Thank you.